So we're asked this interesting question about what are the urgencies of our time? And I think it's a good question because so many people are stressed and anxious about very big and abstract uh, developments that are hard to understand and therefore hard to respond to. My starting point is that we are in the transition from something, but also to something. What we're in a transition from is a history that arguably goes back 500 years or more, the history of capitalism as, a, as the DNA of the economy, as the logic that structures the transactions of our daily life. And so for that to be unwinding, which I think it is, is the end of a very long uh, process that is unlikely to uh, happen in a calm way. In the shorter time frame, we can say that uh, we're seeing the unwinding of the uh, neoliberal period of 50 years, a bit uh, less of my whole life has been um, occupied by that uh, mental picture of the world. Or as my friend Cormac Russell says, maybe things are not getting worse in the world, they're just getting uncovered, that the things that uh, appear to us as a crisis at the moment are actually phenomena that were always there the energy intensity of the economy, the DNA of perpetual growth, and so on. But having said that, we're on the way to something as well as from something. I think my theory of change, I borrow it from the physicist Ilya Prigozhin, who said that when the system as a whole uh, is unstable, small islands of coherence have the power to change the big picture. And so in my practice as a writer in the a philosopher and a curator, my whole life is about seeking out small islands of coherence that in different ways are examples of the more healthy and more thriving world that lies ahead. And it can be everything from uh, discussing the kind of recipes for using peas in Sweden to learning about caring for elders in Singapore. Um, and my basic experience is that the world is filled with examples of positive alternatives of provisioning for our daily life needs to the ones that are clearly going so badly wrong. And so I think that for all of us, there is a practice called seeking out those people and projects who are creating viable alternatives, connect with them, find a way to relate to them, offer your services and your skill and your time and your trust, and take it from there, which I think is uh, the practice of the urgency of our time is to not be obsessed by time frames, but more about connecting one step at a time. There is a sense that uh, we have a crisis of imagination. I don't actually like to think that we have a crisis of imagination. I think we have a crisis of attention, a crisis of distraction. You know, lots of people have written over the last years about the fact that we live in a desert of the real, and that whether it's media as kind of immersive environments or just channels of information that distract us. I think that the anxiety that so many people feel at the moment is because we're not able to, because of this distraction, uh, to concentrate and attend to the pockets of life, the pockets of positive activity that are all around us if we only choose to look, look, look for them. And I was inspired to learn that the situationists decades ago, uh, talked about the need for a reversal of perspective, rather than attend to and be bewildered by the, the crisis, which is, of course, very visible everywhere. Look instead, so to speak, somewhere else at the edge of the picture for these small islands of coherence and make that your starting point. And I must say, during the, yeah, during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic of the last months, you've seen that happening in lots of miraculously tiny ways. Uh, the number of people who now have become um, experts about the weeds in the sidewalk outside their urban apartments, it's like exploding phenomenon of uh, discovering and um, connecting with life very close to you, even if you can't leave your apartment. So all over the world, people are exchanging notes about weeds. Small acts of care everywhere uh, happening, not visible, not reporting because of the kind of clamor of the crisis. Small acts of hospitality and generosity, often to do with food. Um, my, I live in a small village in France, and everywhere I go in this small village, I see people uh, caring for each other in small micro ways, just out of a kind of instinct for that to be 
a way to go on. So in terms of imagination, I don't think we have to imagine alternatives. The, imagine, uh, the alternatives are there. We have to find them, connect with them, and figure out ways to help them flourish. I think that again, um, we have to move away from this obsession with productivity and growth. Of course, everybody is saying that in words, but I want to give you a, a practical example of who is going to care for elder people. That's a big discussion. You've seen a, all sorts of different crises in the pandemic, but also more generally over the last many years. And then the two things that I've learned is that if you change that question, say where in the world do elders, older, elderly people, do they not have the anxiety of being looked after? Firstly, in large amounts of Asia, where a Confucian duty of care to elder people is built into the culture and is not regarded as exceptional, and all sorts of practical consequences that follow from that. So we in the West have invented this uh, horrible anxiety creating uh, doubts about elder care. And then secondly, there are parts of Europe where we are in this old event, um, where you have incredible pockets of alternatives that mysteriously don't get attended to, such as in Northern Italy, where something like 15,000 autonomous care cooperatives provide a big proportion of the kind of social welfare and social support and social solidarity that the rest of us think has disappeared, working with municipalities. So there's a good example of a pocket of an alternative that we can learn from. We don't need to use our imagination for that. There's a very interesting kind of phenomenon in places like China, where I spent a bit of time, uh, where it's not so much a kind of political or a strategic question, it's day-to-day -day politics. There are 230 million smallholder farmers in China, a big chunk of the population, a big part of why that country has more resilience in terms of food than many others. And so when one looks for uh, there are very practical things are happening in which very old patterns of trust and uh, reliability are added to and augmented by new networks. So for example, the live streaming connections between farmers in the countryside and the people who eat their food in the city are exploding in an amazing way. And things that we in Europe talk about is in terms of, wouldn't it be nice if we had a better relationship with the farmers? In China, they say, yes, it would be nice. And by the way, here are the infrastructure for that to happen. And this word infrastructure, I think, is at the key of what we can do, uh, having made the kind of cultural and psychological and political choice to look for the alternatives, to look for the small islands of coherence. Once that is at the center of our attention, it is true there are many things that can be done uh, to create connectivity and uh, help them to thrive. And so this notion of social infrastructure, for me, is where those of us with a design kind of tendency or those of us looking for ways of uh, directing state spending or state support social infrastructure is the kind of area which generates work and jobs and livelihoods it, it combines new tools such as the platform cooperatives using media with old traditions that have been proven to work and indeed for thousands of years was how we organized things in the past so i just think that if it's about social care organizing food organizing for, the, for the, uh, the connections between farmers and producers. Um, all of these things can be um, invented and augmented and enhanced um, moving forward. But maybe to kind of draw it to a close, I don't want to pretend that I'm just one of those people who ignores politics or governance or the legal system. It is complicated, but to me, one of the most inspiring uh, developments of the last period is this notion of um, creating legal systems to support the rights of non-human life, legal systems to support the rights of social solidarity, legal systems, in other words, that you know, provide a duty of thrivability or co-thriving as the basis upon which we measure how well things are going. So the rights of nature, the rights of non-humans, the rights of social systems to provide solidarity, 
without the profit or money motive being in the middle. All of this is coming along. Um, and I think that we have this convergence of the small islands of coherence, the, um, the infrastructures to enable those islands to connect with each other, and the legal and governance systems from another direction helping to give the whole package a strength and dynamism which it hasn't had before.